Good morning, everybody. Pastor Allen here. Very special word of welcome to everybody at all of our campuses and to everyone else who's going to be joining us by video. Are you ready for some good news? It's simply this. There is joy in giving. I have two verses for us. The first is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul has written all about how giving is like sowing and reaping and then he has this to say at verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And then one other verse that we'll be looking at some other portions of the story, but this is in Nehemiah. And it is the story of the joy of the people in their glad gifts and sacrifices in the midst of their celebration upon the rebuilding of the Jerusalem walls. It is Nehemiah, it's chapter 12, and this is the verse I want to highlight, 43. Nehemiah 12, 43. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. One verse, joy is referenced five times amidst all of their glad sacrifices and giving. Once upon a time, a church secretary answered the phone, and she was taken aback by the man on the other end of the line who sounded kind of crusty as he said, I want to speak to the head hog at the trough. And the secretary said, well, sir, if you are referring to our senior pastor, I'm quite sure he is unavailable at the time. And the crusty old fella said, well, that's a shame said, I wanted to come over there and bring a check in for $100,000 to donate. Uh, the secretary instantly responded, hey, wait a minute. I think the big pig just walked in. <laughs> I, I have been hesitant to even speak of or preach much on the subject of giving uh, in, uh, over the course of much of my ministry uh, for two primary reasons. The first is that it seems that no one wants to hear about it. <laughs> well, uh, why, why would I say that? Well, let me put it this way. I've been in ministry over 30 years, and I have had every kind of prayer request imaginable. I have had a bald man come and ask me to pray that his hair would grow. I've prayed for all kinds of pets, from goldfish to cats to horses. I have prayed for people that want to receive every manner of spiritual gift from the Lord, those that want to uh, have more faith, those that would like the gift of prophecy or discernment, and those that would like God to bless their craftsmanship. But in over 30 years of ministry, I have never, not one single time, has anybody ever come to me and asked for prayer that they could become a more generous person? <laughs> Never even had anybody ask for the spiritual gift of giving. And, and here's a close uh, corollary to that. In all those decades of ministry, likewise, I have never had anybody come to me and confess that they just weren't a very generous person. I have had every other kind of confession, every kind of sexual immorality and deception and bitterness and thievery, you name it, but nobody's ever come to me in tears and said, Pastor, pray with me. I need, need to confess that I'm, I'm not as generous as I should be. <laughs> no, it doesn't seem like many people uh, want to hear about this subject because they don't seem to think it's a problem or they're nervous if anybody were to start talking about it. That's the first reason. But the second reason that I think over the years that I've hesitated to preach on the subject of giving is a much bigger reason. And it was very important for me to get in touch with this. And it hasn't been until recent years that I've been in touch with this. And that is that I am called by the Lord to be a preacher of the gospel. Gospel means good news. And as a preacher of the gospel, what that means is that I am called to make an announcement of an extraordinary gift that has been given to us in Jesus Christ. 
to announce that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. And instead of preaching in a way that is not really the gospel at all, but just good advice, good counsel, or mere moralistic exhortation, I have discerned from the Lord that my mission is, as it should be, to make an announcement that brings a gift to the hearer. The gospel is a message of abundant life in Jesus Christ. And so, if I'm not convinced that what I have to say to you is good news, if I'm not convinced that what I have to say to you is something that is giving you a gift from the word of God, then I shall not proclaim it. And because over the years, I, like you, have heard so many messages about giving that seem to either just play on the emotions or have a mild form of shame or guilt that is attached to it or just simply seems to come alongside of the moralistic age that says, well, if you were a good person, you would give more. Because I've heard it like that, I hadn't had it settled in my heart of how it is that I give you a gift if I preach on this subject. And all that changes with Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Because when we hear the words of Paul saying, remember the words of the Lord Jesus who said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive, that changes everything. Because if in fact it's more blessed to give than receive, then if I could lead you into generosity, I would be leading you into blessedness. If I could lead you into a lifestyle of giving, I would be leading you into joy. And so that's why I've become unhesitant to proclaim the excellencies of Christ in this truth of it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I've selected for us today, first this sentence from Paul to the Corinthians about how God loves a cheerful giver to show you that this is absolutely the heart of the New Testament message about giving, and it is not something of compulsion. It's not something that you are supposed to feel uh, motivated by guilt or fear. But I wanted to show you this story from Nehemiah because it illustrates this principle of joy and giving amongst a people who had risked a lot given a lot, and been through and endured a lot. And yet, when they came to the moment of dedicating the walls that they had rebuilt under Nehemiah's leadership, just when you think they'd given all they had to give, spontaneously they wanted to give even more. And the text says they made great sacrifices. And there was so much joy that it was heard far away. Joy, joy, joy. There is a link between joy and generosity, and this is uh, the subject for today. There is joy in giving. It's more blessed because there's great joy in our giving, and the giving itself is a link to great joy. And I just want to talk to you for a few moments about that today because it'll change everything in your life if you come to really believe it. I'm going to just start today by just telling you a tale of uh, two kings. I I often speak of watershed um, in this sense, that like in the Americas, there is a continental divide that starts somewhere in a mountainous region of Alaska and comes down through the Rockies and into the Andes. And if a drop of water were to fall or a snowflake on one side or the other at very near the peak of the continental divide, it could fall very close within an inch of another drop on the other side of the continental divide. But theoretically, if that drop of water were allowed to keep running all the way through the tributaries and streams and rivers and make its way until its final destination. One drop on the westward side would wind up in the Pacific Ocean and the other drop, which might have fallen just an inch apart from it, would make its way all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And in other words, a watershed means that something that might seem very similar at its peak, if you carry it out to its extreme, to its final destination, you would see it as the difference in two oceans. And I think that life is like this in so many ways, but when it comes to this principle, here it is again, that there are those who live and believe as if it's more blessed to receive than it is to give, and that's on one side of the watershed, and there are those that believe that it's more blessed to give 
than it is to receive, and that's on the other side of the watershed. And while the two, and, and the two different approaches of life, if they were towards the watershed peak, might not seem very different at all. If you carry it out to, the, to their uh, destinations, then it becomes two different oceans, tale of two different kings. The first is a king of industry. I was taken by this story because of a movie that had been recently released called All the Money in the World, I think was the title. It's about J. Paul Getty, who at one point in his life uh, was the richest man in the world. He is one of the richest people that has ever lived. At his death, he was worth $6 billion, which in today's dollars is $26 billion. J. Paul Getty died. He had $26 billion, with a B, billion. That's 26 thousands of millions. It means he could spend $1,000 a day for 71,000 years and not run out. Or put it this way, if J. Paul Getty had 50 years to live with all of that wealth, he would have to spend $1.4 million every single day in order to run out. $1.4 million for 50 years. But when his 16-year-old grandson was kidnapped in 1973, he refused to give any ransom money. Eventually, the kidnappers mailed in the severed ear of J. Paul Getty's grandson and said they would continue to mail body parts. And eventually, uh, the kidnappers reduced their demand down to $3 million, and Getty gave his son $2.2 million after all this time to pay the ransom, wouldn't give him more than 2.2, he wouldn't give the $3 million because he found out that the 2.2 would be tax deductible and anything beyond it wouldn't be. And so he loaned his son the remaining $800,000 at 4% interest. This man was one of the stingiest men who ever lived. He installed a payphone in his mansion in England so if a guest had to make a long distance call, they had to go take coins and use a payphone. His fifth wife, said that Getty scolded her for spending too much money on their terminally ill son's medical treatment. Paul Getty did his own laundry by hand. He reused stationery. You wrote him a note, he'd write his note back to you on the uh, margins of it and mail it back to you. He once took a group of friends to see a dog show in London and he made them walk around the block for 10 minutes because he didn't want to pay the five shillings per head and it was going to become half price at 5 p.m. One time he threw a big party. Once in his life, he threw a big party to celebrate the purchase of his Sutton Palaces, his pl Sutton Place estate in England. And, but he made the porta made the party goers use porta potties outside when they needed to use the restrooms. He died miserable and alone after being married and divorced five times and never satisfying a ravenous, sexually promiscuous appetite his whole life. And I was the first king. I'm going to tell you about a second king. He is a man that was in our church, an elder in our church, and his name was King Brown. I was his name. His name was King, <laughs> King Brown. You've never met anybody like King Brown. He was one of the happiest men I have ever known in my entire life. Uh, no exaggeration. He was, a, he was a little man in stature and a huge man in heart. He was a mail carrier and had a lawn mowing business before lawn mowing business was big business. Uh, he bought his clothes at Goodwill. He couldn't imagine paying retail for a pair of shoes and he spent almost nothing on himself. But for an entirely different reason than J. Paul Getty. And King Brown wanted to give to missions. About the only time that I ever saw him get a little bit upset was at an elders meeting when we had decided painfully that we needed to cut the missions budget in a certain area that was going to remove one of his favorite world missions from the budget. Afterwards, he came to me concerned about this. He said, Brother Pastor, that's what he called me, Brother Pastor, he said, I'm so sorry to do this, but if we're going to take that out of our budget, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to have to designate some giving to that, and uh, that's going to impact uh, my own regular giving to the church. Well, I knew the king gave so much to missions, and I finally just said, you know, I've never asked anybody this before, but I just thought I'm going to ask king. I said, king, I'm just going to ask you a question. I said, thank you for all your love for all the missions all over. I said, but I just want to ask you, do, do you... Do you give uh, much to the general fund of the church before you give to all this? I mean, do you give, do you, do you give 10% to the church before you give to all these other missions which are so worthy? And he got quiet and he thought about it and thought like he was calculating his mind. <laughs> and he said, Brother Pastor, he said, uh, I'm currently um, giving... Uh, 30% to the church, <laughs> and then I'm uh, just giving above and beyond that to missions. 
I went to talking to him further. He had one season in his life where he was giving 50% of all that he made to the church. King Brown, a retired mail carrier, was one of the highest givers in our church. He absolutely loved it. And he was one of the happiest people that I've ever known. Two frugal kings, but one's on one side of the watershed and one's on the other. If you trace it, there is a generous person and a greedy person. And it is two different, endlessly deep oceans where they wind up. One is an ocean of misery and one is an ocean of happiness and joy. And these people that were celebrating on the day of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem had found their way into that ocean of joy. They had battled so hard. Nehemiah was uh, the cupbearer to a pagan king when he got a vision uh, of what could be done for the rebuilding of those walls. And by many miraculous and marvelous means, Nehemiah was allowed to go and lead this rebuilding effort of the walls that had been torn down by Nebuchadnezzar's troops when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem. And there had been so much opposition to the rebuilding efforts, like you read in Nehemiah chapter 4, at verse 15, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plans, these enemies that had sought to thwart their plans, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on constructions and half held the spears, shields, bows, coats of mail. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. They labored with a trowel in one hand and their sword in the other hand because there was so much opposition. They had, they had endured so much for years in their rebuilding efforts and they'd given so much. Like in Nehemiah 7, you hear some of this starting at verse 66, the whole assembly together was 42,360 besides their male and female servants. And they had 245 singers, their horses were 736, and lists how many camels and donkeys they had. And some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury a thousand derricks of gold and 50 basins, 30 priest garments. And some of the heads of the father's houses gave into the treasury the work 20,000 derricks of gold. And what the rest of the people gave was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 minus of silver, 67. It lists all that they'd given. So it's a picture here in this rebuilding effort of battling the mockery, the persecution, and the outright en enemy attempts to thwart their efforts, whereupon they had to battle, even to build. And they gave, and they gave, and they gave. So they're working, and they're sweating, and they're working, and they're sweating, and they're fighting, and they're resisting, and they're enduring, and they're giving, and they're giving, and they're giving. And just when you would feel like they had given all that they had to give, they have the rededication uh, of these, the dedication of these walls that they'd rebuilt. And when they did, they offered, the text said, great sacrifices that day. Just when they had given all that they had to give, they come and joyfully give in these sacrifices, rejoiced, rejoiced, five times mentioned in our one verse today, joy, 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 joy in their giving. There's a connection between joy and giving, especially interested in this phrase in verse 43, God had made them rejoice with great joy. You might have thought that God made them to give or God forced them to sacrifice, but that's not what the text says. It says God made them rejoice with great joy. There was something that God had done. It was something God had caused to happen, their joy. How, does, how did God bring this about in their lives? Well, the first thing to say about this is this very phrase in this area runs completely contrary to the low-level motivations that are so often employed for giving. You see, oftentimes we're we have giving because of mild guilt. That's where I have more than others and I think I ought to do something to help others. And, um, or you can give out of a sense of wanting to just boost your own self-esteem. I'll feel better if I get. Uh, a telethon leader on television once said point blank, if you'll send us $100, you can look yourself in the mirror and know you're a good person. <laughs> so uh, that's the way we tend to feel is either I feel a little guilty, I ought to give, or I'll feel better about myself uh, as I give. I remember my wife and I, when we were in Atlanta, many, many years ago living there, and we went to visit a mega church. It wasn't very far from our home, and I couldn't believe it, but right before they took up the offering, they had, a, uh, had everybody who 
gave 10% of their income or more to the church to stand up and recite out loud the tither's motto. And essentially they would stand up saying that I give 10% of my income and I will tithe and I pledge to tithe. And so the people who didn't were remain seated and, and, and those who were standing, what, what recourse is there except to say that I feel better about myself because I'm standing and you're not standing. I couldn't even believe this. I just, there is a, a motivation that God has that's much greater than this. And this is what the text is talking about. God made them to rejoice. It wasn't God who was calling them through some guilt or emotional manipulation. But in the first place, God gave them joy because he gave them a vision that was beyond themselves. These people weren't building a wall for their own homes. They were building a wall for the city. They were building a wall for the well-being of the community. It was the community's well-being. It was a stake. It was something that was greater themselves. You are created for a greater purpose than your own selfish desires. And as long as your life is, like J. Paul Geddes was, centered around your own selfish desires, around your own gain, as long as your life is centered around that, you're not going to be happy in this world. You're made for something much more than that. You're like a cell in the human body. You are uniquely made by God, and you've been given good works to do, and you've been made by God for such wonderful purposes. A cell in the human body is so miraculous and marvelous, it's, it is, it's mind-bending to think that your heart is beating right now because there's a secret code within each one of the heart cells telling it to be a heart cell. And it's joined together in the purpose of being a heart, but it's composed of individual cells. You're like, like that. Your life is like that. The mystery of human life that depends upon the development of life that begins with a single cell is absolutely mind-boggling. I love the words of Harvard-trained physician, the former dean of Yale Medical School, Lewis Thomas, who had this to say, the mere existence of that cell should be one of the greatest astonishments of the earth. People ought to be walking around all day, all through their waking hours, calling to each other in endless wonderment, talking of nothing except that cell. If anyone does succeed in explaining it within my lifetime, I will charter a skywriting airplane, maybe a whole fleet of them, and send them aloft to write one great exclamation point after another around the whole sky until all my money runs out. <laughs> And I'm saying if the cell of the human body is so extraordinary, how much more are you and the calling on your life of God who has put you into the body of Christ for a purpose that is so much greater than yourself? And I'll tell you, when you get in touch with that and when you begin to feel it, you have it coursing through your veins, you are tapping into the very design of God in your life and it causes you tremendous joy. I think another reason that there was so much joy amongst the people of God in their rebuilding effort was because this whole mission of Nehemiah to rebuild these walls, it had stretched them and taken them into the realm of faith. And they didn't initially have the resources they needed. They didn't know how they could get it done, and they had so many obstacles. But when you're living by faith, you're living in the realm of joy. Everything in this world seems to operate by scarcity, but when you have faith, you're operating according to the principle of God's superabundance. He's a father, and he has everything, and so when you have faith, your faith is in the person, it's in your father. It's, it's one of the reasons that, that children are the greatest example of what it means to be great in the kingdom of God, because when they're little bitty, I mean little children, they haven't yet figured out that their father has scarce resources, you know. I loved it when my kids were so little, they didn't even, they didn't think I could run out. Daddy, tell me another story. They thought I was full of an endless supply of stories, that I would never grow weary, that I would never run out of imagination. Uh, it's why my daughter, Abby, would always want me to, why could we not get her a horse? I mean, surely you have endless resources. And I tell you, when you live in the realm of faith in a father who has endless resources, what you're doing is you are appropriating by faith what is yet to be in your hand. You know your father has it, and you're living by faith that you will one day see it, but you don't have to walk by sight in order to have joy about it now. These were the people of God who were walking in faith, and there's joy that accompanies that. Here's another reason they had so much joy. The joy that they had was in their connection to a story that was bigger than their own. It wasn't just a purpose that was bigger than themselves, but it was a story that was bigger than their own story. So the joy of God was their own joy. Oh, I wish there was a way to explain this, but this comes close as I can think of. Uh, 
Gordon Dalby, a friend and mentor and absolutely wonderful author, once told of the conversation that he and the men in his family were having after a big Thanksgiving meal, and the men gravitated to the outside back patio and began telling stories. And so Dalby picked up his preschooler son and took him out and was holding him there while they began to tell stories. And the brother-in-law host started telling of a big bull snake that often visited the patio on hot afternoons. And uh, Dalby's boy gripped him tighter the same way that he would when his eyes would grow big when Gordon Dalby told his son's favorite story uh, over the years he would tell his son that many years ago when Gordon was in the Peace Corps and was in Nigeria he went uh, crocodile hunting and uh, oh boy his son loved hearing that story well there they were on the back patio and this little boy is listening to the men telling their stories and they talked to the big snake and then the conversation turned to coyotes and it turned to the fierce desert pigs known in the area and suddenly out of the blue, Gordon's preschool boy just blurted out, one time daddy and me went crocodile hunting in Nigeria. Uh, Gordon's like, uh, what? And the uncles all looked surprised, and then the little boy said, it was very scary. After the rainy time stopped, we jumped into the forest to the dry streams to catch him. We put a giant hook and some meat on the rope and bamboo pole and saw his footprints in the sand and went to see if we got him, but he took the meat and we didn't get the crocodile. <laughs> Later, and Gordon thought about it and said, hadn't I taught my son not to lie? Uh, th that event had taken, 25, taken place 25 years be uh, earlier, before the son, long before his boy had ever been born, and he thought about it. And this is what Gordon wrote. He said, then it struck me. The boy was dead serious. His intensity was genuine and heartfelt. He wasn't lying. In fact, my son was telling the truth, a deep truth that we modern men, so unfathered and lost in the present, have forgotten. The father's story is in the son's story. The father's story lives in the son. Even the son has not been the one who actually lived it out, but it is the heart of the father in the son. And I want to say this, that when you give, what happens is the Father's story becomes your story. You might not be able at any given point to give a lot, or you might be able to give in great measure. But when you give, and I'm inviting you into it, to something that's bigger than yourself, like cells of a body all working together for something that is extraordinary, what you're doing is you've come into God's story, the Father's story. It is an invitation to live the sort of life that one day you look back on and you're able to say, me and the Father changed a city. To look back over it and say, me and the Father changed the world by the saving news of Jesus Christ. To say, me and the Father we fought, fought the great battle against the darkness and we prevailed. Because it is God's story, but it becomes your story. And so it was for the people of God as they celebrated the day of the dedication of the walls that had been rebuilt. God was the one who had provided the means and the strength, but he'd allowed them to be co-laborers giving with all that they had. And because of it, God's story was their story, and their story was God's story. And they celebrated with tremendous joy. Our story, I said uh, earlier, a story of two kings, but our story is a story of three kings. Ours is a story of the king of kings, who showed us the nature of God himself, for the king of kings came in a person named Jesus and he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant. And it was Jesus' joy, his own joy, to give his life away. His joy in even taking obedience upon a cross before him was set a tremendous joy, the scripture says, 
that caused him to even endure the suffering and shame of the cross so that he could become your sin and give his life as a ransom for many so that you, when you accept Christ, would receive from him not only forgiveness, but you would receive life abundant. You would receive not only the purging of your sin, but you would receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, something begins to change on the inside of you because the Spirit of Jesus is within you. And the Spirit of Jesus is a giving spirit. And when you learn to walk in it, you have discovered great joy. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And there is in the giving tremendous joy that is part of that blessedness. There's joy in giving, and that's the gospel.